NBA on NBC. The 1998 NBA Finals. Tonight, it's Game 3. The Utah Jazz versus the Chicago Bulls. The United Center, where over the last three years, the Bulls are 28-2 and two in the playoffs. And where, if they can hold serve through the next three games, they can win a sixth NBA title without ever having to return to Salt Lake City. Hi, and welcome to Game 3, everybody. I'm Bob Costas. Let's return momentarily to the subject of Carl Malone. He is playing for two things in this NBA final. One, of course, for Utah's first NBA championship. But also, his protest to the contrary, he is playing for his place in NBA history. Now, nothing can take away his certain spot on the Hall of Fame or his place on the short list of all-time great NBA players. But it's an undeniable fact that it is here on this stage, the NBA Finals, that players define find themselves, that greatness is authenticated. And going back to last spring, six games and a loss to Chicago, and through the first two games here in this NBA final, Carl Malone simply has not been Carl Malone. There's still plenty of time, but he knows that if he doesn't get started, his team has a very slim chance of emerging as the champs. We will not win this series if, if uh, I don't play better. And uh, that's just facts. That's just the way it is. Uh, we have other guys that step up, but if I don't play well, if Carl Malone don't play well, we don't win this series. We're joined by Isaiah Thomas and Doug Collins. Doug, your thoughts on Carl Malone's struggles. Well, Bob, everybody's talking about his shot selection, but if you look at the first three rounds of the playoffs and the first two games of this series, his perimeter shooting, the percentage of shots is basically the same. The difference is he shot 42% in the first three rounds, and in the first two games, only 14%. He got good shots. In game one, he shot only nine of 25. But after that game, he said, you know what? I have to keep shooting. Well, he did in the first half half of game two. He took 12 shots. He was 5 of 12. But come the second half, only four shots. 0 for 4. Now he's the star of this team. He's the guy they go to. Bob, he must work hard for his shots, but more importantly, he's got to keep shooting. And Zeke, how about this contrast? While Malone was hoisting only four shots in the second half of game two, Michael Jordan himself shooting under 50% for the game and for the series was nonetheless taking 20 shots in that half alone, exactly half of all the shots put up by his team. Bob, Utah must find a way to stop the big three of Chicago. And when you talk about the big three, you're talking about Pippen, Jordan, and Kukoc. Their size and their length enables them to get inside and get great low post position over their defenders. Their athleticism is, makes it easy for them to jump over. And when they don't double team Jordan in the low post, he's able to do what Carl Malone is not able to score. Now when they bring size, that leaves the middle open for penetration, and Pippen goes in for the easy dunk. Jordan, Pippen, Kukoc, the big three. When you look at their numbers, they got 75% of the team's points, but more importantly, 75% of the team's shots. Now, you're not going to stop Jordan, but if you're Utah, you must find some way to contain Pippen or Kukoc. Bob? Well, Zeke, game three is just around the corner. We'll have the starting lineups and the opening tip from the United Center right after this. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Miller Lite, who reminds you that a Miller time can be anything you want as long as it feels good. By the new Nissan Altima. Nissan, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride. And by Nike. For tonight's opening lineups, here's the familiar voice of Ray Clay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Chicago Bulls welcome the world's greatest fans to the United Center. Tonight's Game 3 of the NBA Finals is between the Utah Jazz and your Chicago Bulls. Now fans, let's meet tonight's starting lineup.
as a part of our starting lineup, Ahmad Rashad. All right, thanks, Bob. Michael Jordan told me there was good and bad about winning the game the other night. He said the good was the fact, obviously, that they won the game. The bad was it could be like fool's goal. All of a sudden, they get too confident and get run out of here tonight. He said he doesn't think that's going to happen because they still feel like they are the underdogs. In terms of home court advantage, he said it doesn't matter. They just want to win four games no matter where it is. The one player that he is concerned with is Carl Malone. He said Carl Malone is a great player, and sooner or later, he's going to be great. The guys just got to make sure it's not tonight. Now, for more on the Jazz, let's go down to Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Ahmad. Well, the Jazz are going to start Greg Ostertag tonight, and the reason Jerry Sloan is going to do that is he wants his size in the game. He wants him to clog up the middle. He wants him to try and block some shots. He also knows that Greg Foster was very ineffective defensively in the first couple of games, just two points in his first two games. So Ostertag is going to guard Luke Longley, and Carl Malone now will go out on Tony Kukoc. The problem with Greg Ostertag, why he didn't come out for the starting lineup, he's having problems with his contact lenses, and he hasn't been able to see very well. So he may come out for Greg Foster shortly into the game if he can't correct, correct that problem. Bob? Jim, thanks a lot. In just seven minutes of game two, Ostertag scored seven points and pulled in three rebounds. The officials are Hugh Hollins, Dick Bavetta, and Ronnie Nunn. Bob, early in this game, Jerry Sloan wants to disrupt the timing and the rhythm of the Chicago Bulls offense. He thought they did whatever they wanted to do in game two in that first quarter, and it set the tone for the whole game. Longley and Ostertag, each at 7-2, jump it up, and Jordan grabs it for Chicago. Harper guarded by Stockton. Kukoc with six on the 24. His jumper. Rebound taken by Russell. no time and hits the jump shot prior to that through the first two games he'd hit three more jumpers than a dead man three of 22 but he starts out by connecting on his first one tonight Jordan's first shot spills off and Malone takes the rebound who scored 20 in game two, hitting seven of 11. Malone, two of two. See, the thing that I like what Carl Malone has done, his first shot came from inside on the post. He was able to get inside, get the easy shot. That gave him confidence, and then he stepped on the perimeter. You go inside out, not outside in. Hornacek opening on Jordan, who finds Longley, who was fouled on the run. Could have been a three-point play, but the shot fell off. Early offense from Utah. You see Malone on that low post block. Inside reverse pivot, he squares it up, and Isaiah said he hits the little medium-range jump shot, which gives you a lot of confidence. So he comes right back, and more importantly, Isaiah, no hesitation. Squares it up. Those are exactly the same shots he got in Utah, and he's already buried his first two shots. Now what Malone must do, Doug, is stay inside. Don't get baited into taking the outside J. Use the outside J to open up the inside game. See, Bob talked about being 14 of 41, 21 and 16 points. Normally he averages about 28 and a half in the wins in the playoffs for the Jazz. He needs a big day like that today. And he's a 53% shooter for the season. That last foul was on him. Now the pass inside to Ostertag, who was shoved by Pippen. Scotty Pippen is guarding Ostertag, and he's roaming around. So Ostertag is going to have to do two things. He's going to have to get underneath the basket and either get an offensive rebound or make himself available out of the double teams and jump up and dunk the ball. Russell to Stockton, who had 24 in game one, held to nine in game two. His drive and a little throw shot went for. Knocked out of bounds, it'll belong to Chicago. See, when, when Malone comes out and he makes two in a row, you got to go right back to him because the big fella's struggling, so you want to keep him involved. Jordan's fadeaway. Spins off, and Ostertag claims it. Tag, low post against Pippen, muscles in on him, misses, can't hit the tip, 
and Longley clears it. Pippen pull up three. Back tap by Kukoc, and there's another offensive rebound as we go back to part of the storyline of the first two games in Salt Lake City. The Bulls all over the offensive glass. Malone bumps Jordan, no foul. He back rims the jumper, and here comes Utah. Three on two. Stockton to Malone, threw it behind him. Now John recovers, a rare errant pass from Stockton. Well, Stockton was upset because his big man had a dunk, and he would have been three for three. He took away an easy basket. He's three for three anyway as he slices through the defense. Meanwhile, Jordan is 0 for 3. See, Malone's mindset right now is attack. You see everything is going to the basket, not fading away shooting jump shot. Michael with Longley trying to scream for him. Spins around for a sack and hits off the glass. He had to work awfully hard for that basket, though, Bob, and we're just barely starting this game. If they can make him work that hard, fatigue could be a factor. Hornacek comes off the screen and misses. Rebound, Harper. Now it's Stockton guarding Michael. Harper left alone for three. And back comes Utah with a 6-3 lead. Presence of Oster tag. Two defensive rebounds here to start the game. Malone. Bouncing it to nobody in particular. And Kukoc picks it up. Second field goal in nine attempts in the early going for Chicago. Oster tag lost track of Longley, turned his head. Longley slipped right behind him for the back cut, and Harper found him for the layup. Oster tag alone, but the pass is overthrown, and even at 7 2, he couldn't gather it in. Well, you can see what the Bulls are doing. They're leaving Scottie Pippen at half court and doubling Stockton to try to get the ball out of his hands. This also takes him out of the screen and roll in their half court offense. Stockton steps in front, picks it off. Ahead to Russell against this. And an offensive foul as Scotty had established position. That's number one on Russell. So you watch Scotty Pippen in transition, will get his body square and get his chest facing the defender. Russell crashes right in. One of the things to watch for in this game, Scottie Pippen guarding Ostertag puts him underneath the board. Now he can rebound and advance the ball quickly, and they should get easy fast break opportunities. Hornacek fouls Jordan. He doesn't think so, and letting Hugh Hollins have a piece of his mind as he heads back to the bench. Jerry Sloan getting his two cents in as well. Clock stops with 6.54 to play in the first. Utah by one. Carl Malone is off to a great start. The Jazz have gone to him early and in rhythm. He got it early in that little post position. The inside reverse pivot, and he knocks the shot down. Great rhythm here. He steps out and makes it. And then Longley closes out. He drives to the basket and lays it in. Three for three, six points. Off to a wonderful start here in the first quarter. Malone has already gotten Michael Jordan's attention. Listen during the last time out. Ready to go. Hey, because Malone driving. You won't know what you can stop. in the lane. Got it. The Jordan is telling Pippen, is telling Kukoc to slide in front of Carl Malone when he's driving down the lane. But Tony Kukoc is saying, hey, Malone's a big guy. I don't know if I want to sacrifice my body and get in front of him. Hey, this is the finals. You better sacrifice everything. Longley, top of the key. Michael spinning on two defenders and a whistle. An offensive foul on Jordan. Michael is trying to spin away from that double team, Bob. The double team is coming from the top. He's trying to spin baseline and get out of it. That time he hooked with the offhand on Hornacek and got the foul. It's his first. Malone again. Squaring up over Longley. Four in a row. 
The rhythm, no. He, he's catching it, Isaiah. He's taking his time. He's not in any hurry. And you know when you're a little bit of a slump, you hit those first couple shots, that basket gets real big. He's deep in the post right now, which really helps him. Pippen returns it to Harper, and he travels. During the last time out, Ahmad tells us that Phil Jackson warned his players that Carl Malone is an entirely different player tonight, apparently. He's being aggressive, and you've got to be prepared to take the charge. But, man, he comes in there with about as much power as one of those Harleys he likes to ride. Good luck taking the charge. Malone, this time he drives. Same result, though, whether it's to the hoop or from the perimeter, he's 5 of 5. What a difference 48 hours has made. Coach for three. Off the front of the rim, but an offensive rebound for Pippen. Longley traveled with it. He had an open shot, thought better of it, and then walked. Malone started the game out here. Same inside reverse pivot. Longley's got to give him some distance because of his quickness. Knocks the shot in. Now, when you knock it down, what do you do? You better close out and you better play him. So, a little pump fake. He attacks that weak side foot of Luke Longley. Easy layup, no weak side help. You're going to see Dennis Rodman in the game right now. He's going to try to cool him off. But, Isaiah, as you know, once a guy gets started, it's so hard to come in and play defense on him. And, Doug, the great players, you know they're not going to struggle three games in a row. They may have a bad one, a bad two, but very rarely do they have a bad three. Longley stays in. It's Rodman for Kukoc. It's Russell from the outside. It's too long. Jordan got a hand on it, and Longley eventually claims it. Turnaround by Pippen. Longley takes it. Harper's open. And now Hornacek. Ahead to Russell. On the run. Nice move, but it won't fall. Back comes Chicago. Three on two. Jordan against Hornacek. Gives it up to Pippen. And that cuts it to 10-7. Actually, it's Carl Malone 10 and Chicago 7. And although his team leads by three, Jerry Sloan has to continue to be displeased with Chicago's dominance of the offensive glass. Stockton becomes the first player, other than Malone, to score for Utah. Little adjustment there on that screen roll. They went to a double high and allowed Stockton to come off where they couldn't get the weak side rotation. Michael into a crowd. Can't finish it, but he was fouled. It's Ostertag, and it's his first. NBA.com is at the NBA Finals, providing complete coverage of the Jazz and Bulls. Log on now to join a live cybercast with NBA and WNBA stars, or enter the NBA.com arena for same-night video, audio, and photos, live post-game press conferences, and more. You can also send an email to your favorite player or guide the controllable NBA.com to capture the camera angles you want to see live from the arena. Or perhaps all that is too much work for you and you just like to sit in the recliner and watch the game. Either way, the option is yours. Now Utah's gotten off to a great defensive start. The Bulls are only 3 of 13. That's what Jerry Sloan was looking for, but a little bit better defensive rebounding. Rodman on Malone. Here's Hornacek's J. It's too long, and the rebound is taken by Rodman. Longley inside. Blew it. Back comes Utah. A gift two, and he gave it up. Malone. Fade away on Rodman. Six for six. Talk about having an answer for the doubters. What a first quarter for Malone. And it's going back to Utah. Now you watch Malone in the post against Rodman. You see how he gets him deep and he gets Rodman on his back. That's the key to post up play. You got to get the defender on your back. Now you can turn around and take the easy fadeaway Jay. The ball back to Utah on the offensive foul against Pippen. 
Russell does a nice job. We see Carl Malone here again with that fading jump shot, but Russell played a nice angle instead of trying to fight over the screen. He went to a spot and he ran, and Scotty ran right over the top of him. Malone hands it to Isley. The reverse won't drop. Jazz leading it by five. Longley against Ostertag with the hook. See, I like that, though. He missed the layup. They came right back to him and gave him another opportunity to get his confidence back. See, I like the fact that Ostertag's in the game, that Jerry Sloan had enough confidence to play him. He's only been absent 12 minutes in this series. Hornacek into the lane. Wild shot, no good off the glass. Ostertag trying to follow, knocked away from him. Isley takes it from Harper. Malone wants it. Drops it off for Ostertag. And finally, it's Longley who clears the boards with Ostertag protesting that he was fouled. Longley, another hook shot. And he was fouled on this one. Ostertag picks up his second. And we step away. Now Jerry Sloan made the decision to star Greg Ostertag. The centers thus far have been taken out of this series in game one and two. They tried to go to a smaller lineup and keep up with Chicago's speed. But Greg Ostertag was very important to them in the conference finals. And he's coming up big here tonight with five early rebounds. You don't need him for scoring. You need Ostertag for rebounding and shot blocking. Now Foster must come in and supply the same. And we go to Jim Gray. All right, Bob, Greg Ostertag is having a problem with his right eye. At the end of the pregame warm-up, he was poked by one of his teammates. His contact came out. It scratched his pupil a little bit, and it's dilated. And according to the doctor, he's just having a little trouble with his vision. He will be able to return to the game. Right now, they've taken it out to watch the pupil for just a little bit. Bob? Thanks, Jim. One of two for Longley. Cutting Utah's lead to two. Look at this. The rest of the team has hit one of 12. Malone, a perfect six for six. They're trying to get it to Carl. Now it's Hornacek. Jordan on him. Longley comes over with help. Isley with four seconds to shoot. Isley has it blocked by Harper. Who continues his outstanding defensive play. Longley on the run. Trying to get it to Michael and they cough it up with Hornacek the beneficiary. Russell pops free. And misses a wide open three pointer. Looks like Luke Longley's making a conscious effort to try to beat the Utah centers up and down the floor. Michael in traffic. Deals to Kukoc and now Longley. The bounce to Kukoc on the return, and he lays it in to tie the game. That's his first basket. Kukoc had 13 points in game two, all of them in the first half. Not such a quick start for him tonight. Russell from Malone. It won't drop. Chicago looks to take the lead in a very low scoring first quarter. It's Harper on the run, hoping to turn it into a three point play as he had been bumped by Isley. Harper will come to the line with 38 seconds to play in the quarter. Tony Kukoc is at the top. The ball is going to go inside. And watch the great back cut in the pass. As he goes to the to the basket, Tony Kukoc with that slashing move, and that's the way he scored in the first quarter in the first half of game two. Got out on the perimeter in the second half, got nothing going. Harper, a great scorer early in his career with the Cavaliers and the Clippers. That's his first point tonight. But he has six rebounds, two assists, and a blocked shot in this first quarter. Longley goes out, and Scott Burrell comes in. We really got to keep our eye now and when you start going to the benches it's been Utah's advantage in the first two games Chicago's bench must play well here today. One of two but two coaches there to turn it into a three point trip down the floor. And a three point Chicago lead. 
Malone, sandwiched by two defenders. Off to Russell and now Hornacek. Can't tie it. 20 seconds to play in the quarter. They've got some great shots, Bob. They just can't make a shot right now. Chicago's on an 8-0 run. Coach misses. Rebound to Foster with three seconds. They've got to push it up. Isley to Malone on the run. And that's the only shot he missed in the entire quarter. Now the great players don't struggle for low. You knew Carl Malone was going to have a monster game. That's what Michael Jordan was worried about at the beginning. Ahmad told us that. How much of a monster is this? 12 of his team's 14 points in the period. You're watching the NBA on NBC. This is the NBA on NBC. The 1998 NBA Playoffs. Well, Carl Malone's woes in the first two games have been well documented. But the shots that he missed are good shots. The fading jump shot in the post, and you're going to see the little medium-range jump shots that just wouldn't go for him, the foul line jumper. Once again, the little 16 or 17-foot jump shot, the shot that is going for him today. And then now what you've seen him squaring up and taking the ball to the basket. So Carl Malone is mixing up his game inside-outside, giving him a great start. Now he needs some help from his teammates. And by the way, that last shot at the end of the quarter came just a fraction of a second after the horn, so it doesn't count. Officially, he remains 6 of 6 and has scored more field goals in one quarter in this game than he did all night in game two when he hit just five times from the field. Shandon Anderson in, Steve Kerr in for Chicago. Isley bumps off Kerr, throws up a floater short, and Pippen clears it. Now Utah's missed their last nine shots. At some point in time, they're going to have to get a bucket, and they're going to have to go to Malone to get that bucket. Rodman turns, his shot is blocked partially by Malone and taken by Russell. Jordan begins the second quarter on the bench for Chicago. Malone with Rodman on him. On the run, it's Isley missing. And another rebound for Rodman who was poked in the face. And the foul is on Isley, his second. One of the things we saw in the first two games was when Shandon Anderson came into the game, they immediately went to him on the block for two or three quick post-ups. We have not seen that yet. They're trying to get Carl Malone off, but Rodman is doing a good job of staying attached to him and forcing him a step further out on the floor. Stockton back in for Isley, Chris Morris, and Antoine Carr also make their first appearances. Stockton on Kerr, around a Rodman screen with the bounce to Pippen. Scotty into the lane. He banks it home. That was a nice hesitation move by Scotty Pippen. He froze the defender, went down the lane, shot the runner off the glass. Rodman has Carr. Kerr on Stockton. Carr with the jumper. He back rims it, and Chicago returns with the ball, up by five all of a sudden. And Stockton fouls Kerr. Now you watch Scottie Pippen here on the penetration. Watch as he hesitates there, freezes defender, forces Stockton to go back to Kerr, and runs and shoots the one-hander off the glass. This is a dangerous time for Utah right here. They have no scores in the game. They've missed their last 11 shots and look for Chicago to go to Pippen and Kukoc. Here's Scotty. Morris is on him. Into the lane, another runner. He hits it. Yes, he's coming to the line. See, Bob, in game one, Scotty Pippen lived out on the perimeter. He shot a lot of jump shots. Game two, he started slashing and cutting. You're seeing the same thing. You saw the right-hand hook off the glass, the previous possession. This the little runner in the lane and the possible and one for the three-point play. That's the first free throw Pippen has missed in this series. 
Jackson with the Jazz shooting one for 19 other than Malone six for six. Stockton is back in earlier than he's normally into the game. Normally plays Isley longer. Realize he needs him back out on the floor. Sandon Anderson against Burrell. And he finally puts an end to a long Utah drought. I said that's the play that I was talking about that they went to in game two. Went right to Shandon Anderson when Malone was out of the game. Contact away from the ball and a Utah foul. After going one of 19, other than Carl Malone's perfect shooting, they go inside to Shandon Anderson. He squares it up and shoots a tough little jump hook over Scott Burrell. Foul is on Foster. Bulls ball when we come back. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Budweiser. Now is the perfect time to enjoy a fresh, cold, beechwood-aged Budweiser. By Jeep, makers of the Jeep brand Cherokee, Cherokee, and Wrangler. And by Pizza Hut, home of the new Sicilian pizza. Can you handle it? Our overhead shots are from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes, based in Pompano Beach, Florida. This year, Goodyear is celebrating its 100th anniversary and the 73rd consecutive year for its Blimp fleet, which is kind of an oxymoron because no Blimp is fleet. <laughs> Here's Shandon Anderson on the post. You see two guys lifted to give spacing. He's going to come right to the post and post up Scott Burrell. And it's been a good matchup all series for the Utah Jazz, and they're going to need Shandon Anderson with everybody else on the floor struggling other than Carl Malone. You see the numbers on Shandon Anderson, the NBA Finals shooting 58%, averaging nine points, so he's doing a very, very good job out there, giving him some much-needed offense. As he did against the Lakers in the Conference Finals. Chicago ball as we resume, and here's Kerr's jumper. He really hasn't found his touch in the Finals yet. Stockton pushing it back the other way. Shot clock down to six. Anderson's pass intercepted by Kukoc, who flips it to Pippen. Scotty on the move. Dishes to a wide open Burrell. And Foster claims it for Utah. Burrell gave Chicago 15 decent minutes in game two. This is Anderson inside, and it drops for him. But if Burrell does not hit open jumpers like the one a moment ago, he's not of much use to Phil Jackson. They went to Bushler in game two. Today it's been Burrell because Bushler had problems with Anderson. You saw Kuko join him on the last possession. Pippen behind Burrell's screen. And Scotty drills it. He's got eight. The Scotty's shooting the ball extremely well right now, but most importantly, he's giving Michael Jordan a chance to rest. Anderson again. He's fouled this time. Now you watch Sandon Anderson here, and the great pass of John Stockton, the great feed. Look at the rotation on the ball, right into his shooting pocket. All he has to do is step in and finish. That's the first on Burrell. Wednesday at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on NBC. It's game four from right here at the United Center. The Jazz and the Bulls. Game five will be Friday. And a week from tonight, game six back in Salt Lake City, unless someone wins three straight here. Under the 2-3-2 format, this is the 14th year of it. No home team has ever won the third, fourth, and fifth games in succession. But two road teams have. Kukos. And a whistle as three defenders surround him. Isaiah, your Pistons in 90 did it at Portland. And Michael Jordan's Bulls in their first championship a year later did it to Magic Johnson's Lakers at the Forum. Bob, I think game three in the 2-3-2 two, two series is the most pivotal game. It used to be game five, but game three gives you the psychological advantage if you're able to win that game at home or on the road. Bob, they're going to rule this was a non-shooting foul that Greg Foster grabbed Kukoc before he could get the shot up. Now, Foster's being very aggressive. Now they're going to make it a two-shot foul. I guess they've changed it saying, was it a flagrant? 
Well, the Jazz are now over the limit. Okay. That's their 15 foul already. Less than four minutes into the period. Meanwhile, Chicago has only one team foul. The referees were talking and said it wasn't a two-shot foul. They did not realize that it was in the penalty also. So now Chicago will shoot the rest of the way. Malone back in, Jordan back in. Foster out with two fouls, Rodman out, Longley back in. For those of you scoring at home. Chicago by six. Immediately Stockton gets it to Malone. Inside it goes to Anderson, acrobatic shot, but it isn't there for him. Pippen pushing it, Kerr unleashing it. Off the back rim again. Michael out battles Stockton for the loose ball. Tries to take it to the hole and he's fouled. Chris Morris and Shandon Anderson were both there. Now, you got Shandon Anderson who's getting off and who does Chicago go to? Okay, Michael Jordan, I'm gonna fight you in the post. I'm not gonna let you get it. Shannon concedes, okay, I'll back out and I'll let Malone have it. The bull stopper is Michael Jordan chasing him on defense. And then on the other end, out battle Stockton for the loose ball. And there he is on the free throw line. You look at his game time rest, but the actual time that he had was close to nine minutes of rest for Michael Jordan. Six points for Michael. And an eight-point Chicago lead. It's the biggest lead for either team. Malone fakes and drives and draws the foul. Well, he had the open jumper, but decided to take it into the lane instead. One of the adjustments that Utah has made is they're not much running much wing screen roll. They're doing more high or side screen roll, Isaiah. And what it's forcing Chicago to do when they help Malone now has been able to step back. He's catching the ball. Now he's driving the ball to the basket. So the adjustment they have made is to run a little bit more high screen roll or screen roll in the center of the floor. The foul on Longley was his first. I, I just love the way Carl Malone has, has approached this first half. I mean, everything is attack, attack, attack. And a lot of times we talk about aggression and competing. But what that really means is that when you put your head down, and you drive it to the basket. That's what aggression is when you're going forward, not backwards. Perfect from the free throw line thus far as well. 14 in the game. Unfortunately, the rest of his team virtually silent. They trail 27-21. Michael got Anderson into the air, but doesn't unleash the shot. corner their pressure release is to cut back door how often have we seen it in the playoffs Luke Longley makes that beautiful baseline bounce past either Pippen Kukoc or Jordan with the powerful finish and, and Jordan used Anderson's body momentum to force him one way and back cut the other stopped in on the move against Kerr now Malone into the lane trying to dish it off to Carr but the Bulls break it up and steal it Pippen from Michael. Loose ball battle, Scotty to the floor. Anderson finally comes up with it. Stopped it. Inside to Morris, and the assist for John. As you know, the all-time NBA assist leader led the league in assists nine consecutive years, eclipsing Bob Cousy's record of eight. Now you watch Jordan on the back cut. Watch how he'll use his body momentum to get Anderson off guard. He pump fakes him right there, and he'll slide to the corner. Anderson overcut. Oops, I'm going. Back cut. Dunk. You take another look at it, you see him go away, the bounce pass, the feed, the dunk, and you're watching the NBA on NBC. The dynamic duo, no, not Batman and Robin, Jordan and Pippen. When you look at what they've done here in the first half, you see Scotty penetrating in the open lane. When they come to double team, his jump shot is on, it's working. And Jordan splitting the double team, reversing, going the other way for the back cut and the dunk. 
Jordan and Pippen, what they've done in the finals thus far. You look at the score and you look at the rest of the team last year and this year. Well, certainly their balance in this game is a whole lot better than Utah's where Malone has been pretty much perfect and the rest of the team's been out to lunch. Kerr for three. And he still can't find his touch. That was a set play out of a timeout. Michael Jordan came over the top of a screen, stopped and screen stocked, and knowing he was going to bump him on the cut, and Kerr just stepped back. Now Steve is going out of the game. That was a set play to try to push this lead up to nine points. Kerr shot one game six, the clincher against the Jazz here a year ago. He really has been off with his shooting through the first two games plus in this year's final. Malone from Stockton. Offensive foul takes it away. Wave it off. That's wow. number two on Carl. I can't believe they're waving this shot off. I thought Malone had released this ball. It's a real tough call here. It's a beautiful screen roll. You see the pass. Wow, that's a tough call. I think Scottie Pippen flopped on that one. Jordan. At the other end, gets the two for Chicago. What a bad turn of events for Utah, struggling as it is. Malone's basket negated. Jordan immediately comes back and sticks one, giving him 10 and his team an eight-point lead again. Now a Chicago foul. It's on Longley, his second. Luke played only 17 minutes in game two because of foul trouble throughout and eventually did foul out. Now, now you, you watch Jordan away from the ball, moving without the ball. You see he sets Morris up and comes right off the screen, right into the shot. Utah loses it. Jordan back, spinning, fading, firing, and drawing the foul. Shandon Anderson's first. This is going to be very discouraging right now for Utah because they're doing a pretty good job defensively. The Bulls only have 31 points, Isaiah, but they've only found a way to score 23 points. Everything they've done has been in the half court, and the Bulls have just smothered them. You look at Jordan from game one and game two, although he's getting up a lot of shots and he's getting a lot of attempts, the most important thing for Michael Jordan to watch is the free throw line. In game one, he was six of eight. Game two, nine of ten. Let's see how many free throws he's able to get in this game. Neither one of those was clean, but he bounces them both in. He's got a dozen. Shooting just under 44% from the field through the first two games. Oster tag is back into the Utah lineup. The ball is kicked. And that gives Utah a fresh 24. Scottie Pippen is so quick. He's in the middle of the floor. He's trying to get Stockton, push him to the outside, and he's quick enough to get back to his own man. Stockton couldn't prevent it from going into the backcourt. And that was because Scottie Pippen faked like he was going for the passing lane. Stockton reversed it. And they made the pass, and he went backcourt. But see, with Pippen guarding Ostertag, it gives him a free pass to roam around. Chicago trying to add to the game's biggest lead. Jordan Camp. Kukoc has the loose ball, and Chicago has a 12-point lead. Continuing to crush the Jazz with offensive rebounds. Now they trap a little bit. Stockton breaks it with the dribble. And Utah asks for time. 4.51 left in a first half in which every Utah player other than Malone has pretty much been blanked. That's Bobby Sloan, wife of the former Bulls coach, and of course present Jazz coach Jerry Sloan. She has a compelling personal story. Hannah Storm interviews her and her husband at halftime on the Prudential Halftime Report. What a warm and engaging woman Bobby Sloan is. We'll hear from her at halftime. 
Here's Scottie Pippen. Now watch what he's going to do. He's going to chase him off the, the center of the floor. He's guarding Ostertag. Kukoc helps him. Then he gets back. It totally disrupts the Utah offense. Now they've got no place to go. The clock is working against them, and it eventually turns into a turnover. And Doug, Carl Malone started out 5-5 five of five against Longley, but he only took one shot against Dennis Rodman. And the United Center, as loud as it's been all night, now they settle in a bit, but they were really whooping it up as the Jazz tried to inbound. Stockton on the move, back outside to Malone. Now it's Russell. Just before the shot clock, he hits a two-pointer. His foot was just on the arc. That's his first basket. And only the second field goal by a Jazz starter other than Carl Malone. Stockton had the other one. Offensive foul on the Bulls, giving it back to the Jazz with 4.17 to play in the half, and Utah down 10. Rodman is hit with his first. Now Rodman to come over to set the screen, but watch as that elbow extends out. Hugh Hollins catches him. You can't put your elbow out like that. That's an offensive foul. Stockton driving on Harper. His pass picked off by Kukoc. Russell is back. Michael against Hornacek. Ostertag with the help. The bounce in the lane. Harper at first couldn't hold on to it. Now recovers and misses the shot. It's out of bounds. Off Chicago, says Ronnie Nunn. Okay, Chicago is doing a great job defensively. They will not let Stockton get to the middle of the floor. Isaiah, they're driving him to the baseline and smothering him with bigger players, giving him no passing lanes. And they're staying on his right hand because Stockton is a right-handed passer and a right-handed shooter, and they're forcing him to do everything with his left hand. Malone, travel. Through the years, Chicago fans have had their complaints with Hugh Hollins, including in this year's playoffs in the Indiana series. Rightly or wrongly, fans see things with their hearts sometimes, rather than their eyes. Harper inside, dealing it back outside to Kukoc for three, which hits the front of the rim. Stockton now pegging it ahead to Russell. The trailer is Hornacek, and he's got it. But to finish up the thought, Hollins called that travel on Malone, and earlier, called a very iffy offensive foul on Carl, which took a basket away. Pippen. Give the assist to Harper. Now Pippen signaled for that, and he got his feet set because he knew he was going to have to get it up quick because he knew Ostertag was behind him. A block on Pippen. Called by Dick Bavetta, and Scotty now has three. Now you watch Pippen underneath, signaling for the basketball. Jordan to draw it, kick it to Harper. They penetrate out. Now watch as he gets it. He's already set. He can go up quickly because he knows Ostertag is behind him in the shot block. And he gets hit right here, trying to take the charge, but they call the block. And another Chicago foul immediately. This one on Burrell. And finally, that pushes them over the limit with 2.39 to play in the quarter. Now Pippen has been so key to the Bulls defense. We have 239 to go. The Bulls are up 10. Can they find a way maybe to attack this Chicago defense now with Scotty sitting down and try to close this lead maybe to five or six as they go into halftime. Look at the difference in the free throws. That was only the fifth taken by Utah. Chicago to this point has taken three times as many. And Michael Jordan has only taken seven shots tonight, so that might be part of the plan. Get everybody going so he has great energy to finish this game, and it's working right now. The Bulls are up eight. Jordan into the lane, and he gets the roll. He has 14. Chicago by 10 again. Stockton to Malone. Carl on the run, a little hook is an air ball. And Jordan protects the rebound. Robin's doing an excellent job on Malone, taking away his drive. A great catch by Kukoc. That was more impressive than the basket itself. He was able 
to maintain his balance and continue his move to the hoop after a very difficult catch. And now the difference is a dozen. The game two win in Utah has really rejuvenated the Chicago Bulls team. Michael Jordan with Pippen down on the bench right now attacks and makes a very, very difficult shot over the outstretched arm of Greg Ostertag. Look at the eyes of Michael Jordan. He's now playing Stockton. Forces him to spin, and then Rodman with the body bump pushes Carl Malone away, takes a weak shot at the basket, and what does that lead to? Tony Kukoc running out. The great pass from Harper, as Bob said, a wonderful catch. Now remember, Tony's a left-handed player, so his right hand is out of bounds, but his left hand is open for that little flipper. Meanwhile, get this. Malone is six of seven from the floor. That air ball off the hook, his first miss officially tonight. But he doesn't have a field goal since three and a half minutes remain in the first quarter. And I think you have to give Dennis Rodman the credit right now for setting down Malone. Agreed. Stockton on the move. His pass through the lane is intercepted by Jordan. Stockton's turned the ball over several times in this first half. Coach looking for Michael and finding him. Spins on the sec to the left hand. An absolute beauty. Now Jordan went from side to side two times trying to get that basketball in the post. He wanted that shot. He worked for it and he finally got the position that he wanted. As the shot clock winds down, Stockton trying to find somebody. Hornacek looking to create on his own. Nice move, but he doesn't hit the shot. Harper bumps off Stockton and lays it in. Stockton looking up at the official Bavetta saying, hey, come on. Where's the charge? Well, he was, but in he was dotted inside area. the dotted area. Last 40 seconds. Crowd roaring. Chicago by 16. And Hornacek takes two off of it. And look at Michael Jordan. His team's still up 14 points, but he's annoyed because somebody blew a defensive assignment on Hornacek. Looked like he was pointing at Harper, who generally has played tremendous defense in this series. An going to isolate Kukoc to go against Foster. Now Kukoc likes to drive left. Rodman gives it right back to him. Three on the shot clock. Fade away. That's the way it's going for Chicago. A steal by Burrell. Can't add two, but Harper pokes it away. And finally, mercifully for Utah, the half comes to a close. But wait a minute, Burrell took a tumble. And let's see if they call a foul before the half ends. for the Utah Jazz. Unraveling as the second quarter clock winds down. I think they're gonna call a foul right here on John Stockton. You see Burrell makes the inbound steal. Harper knocks it out of his hands, takes a peek at the shot clock, and you see Stockton trying to block out Burrell underneath. And Dick Bavetta called the foul on John Stockton underneath. But see, that's a careless play. You throw away the inbounds pass. You get John Stockton a foul. And it's after Kukoc makes the great shot, now they're going to end up the half with two free throws. That's a terrible momentum play for Utah going in at half. Chicago has been stifling with their defense. Chicago by 18. Utah turned it over 12 times in the half. Malone and Stockton four times each. Coming up at halftime, Hannah Storm's interview with Bobby Sloan. That's on the Prudential Halftime Report after these messages. You're watching the NBA on NBC.
This is the Prudential Halftime Report, brought to you by Prudential. Bringing strength and stability to America's families through insurance, health care, real estate, and financial services. It's halftime of Game 3 of the NBA Finals with the Bulls leading the Jazz 49-31. to Hi everyone, Hannah Storm back in Chicago. Jerry Sloan, the driven coach of the Utah Jazz, is so private, he said he was actually glad he didn't win NBA Coach of the Year because then he wouldn't have to give a press conference. But now Jerry and his wife Bobby are sharing the very personal details of her battle with breast cancer. The Sloans have been married for 35 years. This story begins when they were both growing up in McLeansboro, Illinois. I love telling the story about the first time he ever asked me out. Uh, I was actually horrified because I was five foot nine and he was five foot six. And at that time when you're a young teenage girl, the last thing you want to do is go out with a little short guy with a high voice. And so I said, no. <laughs> and uh, next year he came back and he was six foot two. And that was different. <laughs> and so you finally went out. And we what did. was he like on a date? Um, I told my mom after we came home, I said, that's the last time I'll go out with him. He didn't say two words all night. But six years later, Jerry said, I do. And the Sloans began their life together. While Jerry was an NBA star, Bobby was a nurse and raised their three children, two girls, Holly and Kathy, and a son, Brian, who is now a doctor in Indiana. Last June, Jerry's coaching career had reached its pinnacle two games from an NBA championship. While the Jazz were losing game six in Chicago, Bobby watched alone at their home in Utah. I laid down to go to bed and I felt a really sharp pain in my left breast. And I just reached down and I felt a lump. And I knew that that wasn't part of my anatomy. I knew I was in trouble. Why didn't you tell Jerry initially what your suspicions were? He's, he's never ever really dealt with you know, even when the kids were born, he did anything wrong with me, he's never dealt with it really well. He's kind of, like I, we always say, he's kind of a doomsdayer. You know, and the last thing, you know, when you think there might be something wrong is to have a, another long face around besides your own. And then Brian was given the task of telling everyone else in the family. I was afraid I'd cry, and so I let Brian call him, and he, it, was, it was really cute because after he left, uh, he, he being the medical person that he is, he had everything outlined, you know, of what he was going to tell each person. So there his notes were, and his notes to Jerry were so cute because he said, his notes just had, in order, had written, no long face, no doomsday, uh, she's going to be fine, it's not like it used to be. Don't be your usual pessimistic exactly. self. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. She'll always be a breast cancer patient and now, hopefully a breast cancer survivor, but with a early diagnosis and the treatment that she has received, chemotherapy including surgery, uh, she should have an outstanding long-term prognosis. Brian probably gave me the most uh, encouraging part. He said, I think she's going to be just fine. Uh, that was the thing that uh, probably helped the most because I knew that he knew a little bit about more of what he was talking about than I would ever know. That was a relief knowing that she did have it, that the outcome would probably be positive and uh, but there's no guarantee of that. Oh, yeah, that. That's always in the back of your mind, knowing that it's there, that uh, you know it could be fatal. This was such a, a life-altering event. How did it affect your marriage? I don't know that he knew at that point exactly how to deal with me and the situation. And I didn't read him really well as to how he wanted to deal with it. And so we just both kind of didn't say anything. You know, we just really didn't talk too much about it. And, he continued on with his lifestyle, and I can continue, continued on with mine. And uh, what was the turning point? Uh, the turning point, I think, came shortly after Christmas when he had. It was after a game, and he had come in very late, and they'd been out out at the bars, and he's he smelled like a brewery and a cigarette smoking, and it just it upset me so that I said to him. Uh, here I am fighting for my life, and you're snuffing yours out. And it made me furious. I was just angry. I think that's where our lives together really started to change for the, for the better rather than continue on the path that we were on. That confrontation led to dramatic changes in their lives. To make things right, Jerry first knew he had to quit smoking, a three-pack-a-day habit. 
he quit when the lifestyle was at its most tense, which was during the season. And I, I, I'm just so in awe that he was able to do it. And he says now it, it's for life that he's quit smoking. And, and the drinking and the bars, cut no down more, on that also? He, he doesn't go to the bars anymore. Uh, in fact, I wait around for him after the games now, and we go, sometimes we go out for nachos, and I'm not saying we won't have a margarita occasionally, because we do, but I haven't seen him drink a beer in months. And uh, now instead of going to the bars, we go to the ice cream shop, or we go to the pie house. How do you like it, taking the long walks, going to get pie at night. It's, just, it's, it's a different, it's, it's a different well, it is, life it has for you. Been, it, is, it has been different for us and uh, it's, been, it's been great. I never thought that it would be uh, this way in my life. I guess when you look at, at everything that's happened, as difficult as it's been, you also have to so much appreciate the, the good things that have come out of it. Well, that what we both sit around and talk about that, you know, something that could have been so utterly devastating. Uh, and again, you know, back to, to the reason I'm doing this, you know, is, is the early detection. It has turned into such a positive because, you know, my, now my outlook is good and, you know, you face a, a time, a, a, an event that has a chance to alter your life, you know, where you feel like you're given a second chance. Excuse me. My dad, you know, being there for my mom, having to give her medicines through the night and you know, those are things that you know he never had to do before and faced with this adversity I think they've really made the most of it. Their second chance has come in a hundred different ways. The one that surprised Bobby the most was this. She was now part of her husband's basketball world. Jerry asked you to ride the team bus after they clinched the series against the Lakers the Western Conference Finals. Uh, Were you surprised? Oh, mm -hmm. stunned. I was just you know, as much as even inviting me into the locker room, which that was even more astounding, you know. What but did that mean to you? It just kind of meant like he wanted to include me in it this year. You've been married for 35 years. 35 years. And then this changed. And it's just, it's like night and day. In fact, I, I, I think of our 35th wedding anniversary was April 12th. And we woke up that morning and I said to him, listen, and he goes, what, there's nothing. I said, that's what I mean. For the first time in most of our lives, there's no sound. It's just you and I right back where we started 35 years ago. Maybe we just found each other again, hopefully. In telling their story, it is the Sloan's hope to make people more aware of breast cancer. Bobby Sloan's cancer is in remission, and she says the key is early detection, something that most women talk about, but they don't act on it. She urges all women to conduct a self-examination every month and get regular mammograms after the age of 40. We'll be right back. Facing an 18-point halftime deficit, Utah has to deal with these numbers. Carl Malone is 6 of 7. The rest of the team, 7 of 27 as we take a look at the rest of the Miller Lite halftime stats. Well, Bob, I wish I could tell you there was some good trends for Utah, but there wasn't. 12 turnovers that led to 12 Chicago points. Stockton, only two points and four turnovers in Chicago. Two coach Pippen and Jordan were terrific. 38 of 49 points, 78%. They shot 11 of 14 in the second quarter. And the free throws, they were the aggressors. And that's been the difference in the game. The stifling defense and the great play of the entire Chicago Bull roster. And when you look at Utah, it's been all Carl Malone. Six of seven, 14 points. But the others must play well. They must shoot a little better and step up. You look at Carl's shot chart here, and if you look at the one miss that he has, it's against Dennis Rodman. He started off hot against Luke Longley with six of six, and that one miss is against Dennis Rodman. He's got to do a better job of getting Rodman underneath the score. In Chicago, it's the big three, as we talked about in the opening. Jordan, Kukoc, and Pippen. You look at the others with 11 points, but Utah must find a way to stop the big three. You see Jordan going inside. Interesting enough, he's only taken one outside field goal attempt. He's been attacking the basket, and it's conserved his energy. If somebody told you Carl Malone would hit his first six shots and Utah would be down 18 at the half, you wouldn't believe it. 
Ahmad Rashad back at the United Center where the Bulls lead the Jazz by 18. Now at halftime, Phil Jackson told his team that they had great rhythm. Keep the rhythm going. Now defensively, he said that they're rotating extremely well. Carl Malone's doing the things that they want him to do, but he's just making a lot of shots. But the one thing they don't have to worry about, Carl can't beat him by himself. Let's go down to Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Ahmad. Well, Jerry Sloan wasn't very happy at the half. He told his team, you must develop some type of offensive rhythm. He says, we're totally out of sync. You must execute better. You got to shoot the ball better. Too many turnovers. Gave up too many second chances. He said, basically, guys, we need to improve in every phase of the game and just try and chip away at this. Bob? Thanks, Jim. To make matters worse for Utah, consider this. The Bulls, an aging team with a thinner bench than Utah, has essentially played every other day for two weeks. The only exception to that, dating back to game three of the Indiana series, was the two-day break between the seventh game against the Pacers and the first game in Salt Lake City, but then they had to travel. Finally, following game three and before game four, they'll get two full days of rest at home. If they win this one and win it big, they could be hellacious coming back out for game four, up 2-1. Stockton's shot spins out to start the third quarter. The Bulls look to take their advantage to 20. Kukoc does just that. After a slow start, Tony has 14. Hornacek looking for Malone, out of bounds to the Bulls. Chicago's taking them out of everything they want to do. They only ran seven pick and rolls in the first half for eight points. That was their bread and butter in game one. They can't get the ball in the post now. Chicago totally has them rattled on the offensive end. Their 13th turnover. Two coach against Malone. And an offensive foul as Tony tried to push off. Now that was an offensive foul. The baseline official, Hugh Holland, didn't see it, but the back official caught it because Tony pushed off with his right hand. You see, as he gets close enough, he gives Malone the shove. Now the baseline official can't see that, but Bavetta caught it from behind. Malone's jumper. He starts the second half with a miss. Kukoc. Malone giving him some room. Jordan with Hornacek on him. Michaels baseline J. Line drive shot is short. Stockton back. Poked away by Pippen and taken by Kukoc. To Harper the trail. Left hand no. Rebound Ostertag. Utah has 14 turnovers, five of them by the usually sure-handed Stockton. Kukoc reached over Ostertag and fouled him. Anytime you see Chicago run and uh, John Stockton is to prevent them from running that screen roll. You saw Pippen run over, forced him to give the ball up, longly rotated over to get the Ostertag. So they are totally taking them out of any set offense they want to run. And Chicago's doing an excellent job in keeping that ball in Stockton's left hand. Hornacek spinning, looked like he traveled. And that's the way Ronnie Nunn saw it too. More than two minutes played in the third quarter. Utah still hasn't scored. I just read Jerry Sloan's lips and he said, we've got to pass the ball. We're trying to do too much off the dribble, and the Bulls are reacting with their great quickness. Longley fires from 20 and makes it a 22-point Chicago lead. Pippen on Stockton. Into Ostertag. Mismatch with Harper, but he loses it. Their 15th turnover. Back comes Harper. Spinning around Stockton. Bulls going for the kill. Longley. Batted away by Ostertag. No goal 10, despite Michael's pleas. Here's Russell. Malone. And finally, Utah is in the scorebook almost three minutes into the third quarter. But even that play was an adventure. 
It took Pippa a, a great extra pass to Malone. Scottie Pippen got back and looked like he tried to take the charge on Russell. Didn't get that call. Michael around Hornacek. Russell skies for the rebound. Hornacek makes line, reverse. Got it. And that was a nice seal by Carl Malone against Luke Longley underneath. He laid in the lane, sealed, sealed Longley, and Hornacek was able to drive baseline for the reverse layup. Jordan to the hole. Wrapped up by Ostertag, and somehow, some way, he scores. See, he faked Hornacek right, took him left to the baseline, Hornacek. Taking away that right hand of Jordan gives him the fake. Now he gives him the sweep underneath. Ostertag doesn't give him a good, hard enough foul. So you got to grab that right hand. Don't let him get the shot off. Here's a man 7'2 and 280 trying to wrap you up. And somehow you have the strength and the body control to get off a reasonable shot. Not a lucky shot, a shot that had a chance to go and did. Three point play for Michael. 21-point Chicago lead. Ostertag from Russell. Longley stuffs him. Now he tries a jumper. And that's way short. Flat-footed rebound to Luke. Ahead to Pippen. Harper alone. Chicago by 23. This is just target practice right now for the Chicago Bulls. Lob from Malone, trying to muscle up. And finally, he's fouled. See, Isaiah, one of the problems, you need Ostertag's size out there, but the problem is they're rotating and leaving him alone and then getting to him because he's not an offensive threat. So in essence, what they're doing is Scotty is Roman, and they're forcing them to go to Ostertag, and he just can't finish. And they're leaving Ostertag open underneath, and you saw very vividly right there that he didn't have the type of lift to get it to the basket quick enough. Malone has 17, but 12 of them came in the game's first few minutes. In both 96 and 97, as Foster comes in, and Ostertag goes out, Two years prior to this one, the Bulls led the NBA in scoring. This year, even with Jordan claiming his 10th scoring title, Chicago was only ninth in the NBA in scoring. But their defense makes up for that. It's what assistant coach Tex Witter calls unleashing the Dobermans. They can just suffocate you. And to one of the best offensive teams in the league, that's what they're doing tonight in game three. Jordan's pass picked off by Russell. Kukoc trying to cut him off. He takes it all the way to the roof and Tony fouls him. See, the Bulls have the kind of players defensively, Isaiah. They can switch everything because they're all equal size other than uh, Luke Longley out there. So when you screen down and come off a screen, a guy jumps out in the pacing lane, a passing lane and takes you completely out of what you want to do. Russell hits the first. NBC Tuesday begins with Mad About You. Then after news radio, stay tuned for Frazier, followed by Just Shoot Me and Dateline. That's Must See TV Tuesday on NBC. Two close games in Utah. A runaway in Chicago. Miller Genuine Draft presents even more basketball. Now, Chicago has done an excellent job in forcing turnovers. You see they're keeping the ball in Stockton's left hand, pushing him left, forcing him to make tough passes. And their size and their speed, they're so active inside. You see Oster Tag has a mismatch here in Harper, but Ku Coach Longland is able to get back and tap it out of his hands. Chicago has the three things in the athletes that you can't teach, the size, speed, and skill. And in recognition of this look inside the game, Miller Brewing Company will donate $1,000 to the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship Fund. It's the Bulls delivering a supreme court performance tonight, up by 20. Russell back at the line after the timeout. 
And Pippen claims the miss. It's important for the Bulls to keep pushing here. A 25-point lead as Jordan pops it and misses it. And Malone takes the rebound. A 20, 25-point lead going into the fourth quarter might allow them to rest some people. A 15-point lead would not. And that could become important as the series moves along. And if you're Utah, you got to keep playing because you never know. You know, one of those guys can get injured. You don't want that to happen, but that happens in a series sometimes. Malone turns and shoots from the long way. Second half, a different story than the first for Carl Kukoc. Harper trying to chase it down. They spill to the floor, and Malone picks it up. Russell, unguarded, passes up the three, gives it to Hornacek. Now Stockton misfires on a three-pointer, and Kukoc will take it back the other way. It's almost like Chicago's got six defenders. It looks like Utah has a shot, and someone runs him off the shot, gives it up to someone else, and someone else closes on him. And some of these Jazz players may be gun-shy. Looks like they're bypassing open opportunities. Who coach won't? He's such a tough matchup because you put a bigger guy on him, he beats you with quickness. If the big guy backs off of him, he makes the open shot. If you put a smaller guy on him, he posts you. Russell through a crowd, intercepted by Harper. Utah very ragged, Pippen behind the back. Harper picks it up. Now this is when a triangle offense just picks you apart right here. Jordan to Kukoc, but he juggles it into the hands of Malone. Stopped it. Two cards. Lays it in, but it won't count. Another offensive foul on Malone. Stockton gave that ball up a little bit too soon. He allowed Scotty Pippen to be back, and instead of making him play him where he can drop it off, you don't see this very often. Stockton gives it up, and now Pippen still has time to react. And he gets over. That's twice we've seen that today, where Scottie Pippen has stepped in front of Malone and taken away a score. And Scottie Pippen gave up his body, what he was telling Tony Kukoc to do. And I saw Jordan walk back and grab Tony Kukoc and say, see, that's what I want you to do, is step in front of Malone and take the charge. As we move inside five minutes, here's Scott Burrell in for Tony Kukoc. Isley, who's just returned, is guarding Harper. Ron tries to fade away, and Isley fouls him. Isaiah, watch this. Russell looks like he has a shot. He passed the horn. It's like, look at Pippen. Completely closes. Here comes Kukoc. He takes him up. Here comes Jordan over, gives up the shot. But he forced him to make three extra passes to get that shot off. That's what Chicago has done all day. They've been aggressive. They've been quick. They've been the attackers all afternoon. See, their guards just have too much size and too much speed. You're looking at Ron Harper here on the free throw line, fouled by Howard Isley. Utah's problem is that their guards can't grow. You can't like grow six inches in a game. They're giving up six inches and every time every and every player that they're guarding. Got it out of bounds as Harper misses the second one and Utah will have it. Harper has six points, six assists, nine rebounds. And more importantly, a tremendous defensive job on Stockton. He's kept him to that left hand all day long, and John has not been able to get it in the middle of the floor and deliver to his teammates. And now Stockton is a spectator. Benched for the moment. Man, this is unbelievable. Utah with 38 points, with four and a half minutes to play in the third quarter. And that's with Malone opening the game, sizzling, hitting his first six. I've said all along with Chicago, I said, you've got to find a way to get some baskets early in your offense. If you have to set up too much against them, they'll take you out of what they of what you want to do. Remember now, 21 fast break points in game one, and game two only nine. Today in the first half, only four. As Longley picks up his third foul, Rodman replaces him. Isley has it knocked away, but Hornacek is there to pick it up. To Malone, inside. And now he has 20. See, what Utah has to do right now is they have to find something that's going to work. It might not help them today, but they've got to find something, Isaiah, that they can go to to get some offense. Pippen's jumper won't go, and Russell takes the rebound. Adam Keefe is in for the first time. 
off Utah's bench. Ronnie Nunn says hold on. And he spots a Chicago foul. Now you watch Rodman battling Malone underneath. Neither one of these men are going to concede. Rodman's trying to do everything he can, so he fronts him. What does Malone do? He seals him, goes inside, makes the easy layup. Now this time, he's taking Dennis deep, and Dennis can't compete with Malone's strength underneath. You see he's in the paint, so he tries to knock him off, and he can't get him off. Malone is 5 of 5 from the line, and he has 21 points. So your thought process right now for Carl Malone and the Utah Jazz must be, okay, we got our big fella going now. We got Carl Malone playing. He's in a nice rhythm. We got three chances to win here. We may not win here tonight, but we got two more chances coming up. So you got to keep playing and make the Bulls compete and expend energy. <laughs> You may have heard the fans in the background counting down from 10, contending that Malone takes more than the allotted 10 seconds to release his free throws. Offensive foul on Ron Harper. He started to come over the top of the screen and he grabbed Isley, just threw him away, so he will pick up the foul. So here comes Utah down by 19. They trail by 18 at the half. Keith from Malone. Back outside to Russell. Malone's working on Rodman. Through the lane against him, and he traveled. That's the third basket that Malone has had taken away. Two on charges, one on the traveling violation. Now, Isaiah, the difference is, is Longley has to give him space because of his quickness. Rodman is right up against him. And they got him with a little extra half step there in the traveling violation. Pippen trying to make his way through some defenders and fouled by Keefe, his first. Utah's third team foul. The Bulls are already over the limit. 3.20 to play in the quarter. Jordan into the lane. Knocking it away is Russell, but he got a piece of Michael. Next weekend, the WNBA begins its second season on NBC, Saturday at 4 Eastern, a rematch of last year's championship game as Rebecca Lobo and the New York Liberty take on MVP Cynthia Cooper and the champion Houston Comets. Then next Sunday at 4 Eastern, Lisa Leslie and the LA Sparks face Michelle Timms and Cheryl Miller's Phoenix Mercury. The WNBA on NBC, next Saturday and Sunday at 4 Eastern. One of two for Michael. 20 points. For the 32nd time in 32 career finals games, Jordan has scored at least 20. His career finals average is right around 34. And he's averaging 35 through the first two games of this series. Russell with the head fake and the miss. It's batted to Jordan. And Utah just can't cut in to this 20-point deficit. Make it 22 now. Michael the assist. And Harper could be closing in on a triple-double. I mean, that's just perfect execution. Jordan came off the screen, penetrated. Harper back cut for the dunk. They're just picking him apart right now. Russell blocked by Burrell. Into the arms of Harper. as they run a clinic on the Utah Jazz. Whoever Scotty Pippen is playing, they're putting him on a guy that's not looking to score. And he is just a roamer. Now he's playing Adam Keith. And he's trying to disrupt everything they do. If you watch him, he's not even playing Keith. Malone against Rodman. Harper there with help. Another offensive foul as Malone throws the elbow. And Rodman nods in both agreement and delight. See, Robin is totally frustrated, Carl Malone. Now you look at Jordan here, he's penetrating the lane, and you look at Harper, sneaks behind Isley. There's no help for the dunk. And when you watch Chicago on the fast break, 
You're watching the block by Burrell. I'm going. Harper over the head. No look pass. Two-handed slam dunk. And then back again on defense. Dennis Rodman is in Carl Malone's head right now. Boom. I'm going to give you the elbow. Dennis say, I'll take it. But I'll take the whistle. But that is there for the offensive foul. And you're watching the NBA on NBC. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Miller Lite, who reminds you that whenever you feel good, it's Miller time. By Toyota, every day belongs to you. Make it count. Toyota every day. And by Warner Brothers New Motion Picture Lethal Weapon 4, starting Friday, July 10th at a theater near you. Another view from the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. This year, Goodyear is doubling its Blimp fleet, adding two Blimps in Europe and one in South America. Isaiah, you talked about in the opening that Utah's going to have to do something with Chicago's big three scores. They're going to try to slow one of them down. Well, that has not worked today. Scottie Pippen has been great on both ends of the floor. Michael Jordan with a tremendous shot in the three-point play opportunity. And Tony Kukoc. These three guys have combined for 46 of the 66 points. Michael with 20, Kukoc with 16, and Pippen with 10. During that timeout, they were talking not so much about winning the game, but about sealing this early. Listen. Talking about icing their knees for the whole fourth quarter. If they can put the Jazz away here. Yeah, he wants them to get off this minute 55 and then rest. Jordan takes it upon himself and builds the lead to 26. And the look on his face after he turned around and shot that Jay was another one saying, I'm feeling it, I'm in the zone. Well, he sure doesn't look tired to me. See, I don't think fatigue was a factor for the Bulls coming into this because at the start of the playoffs, they had the same amount of rest as Utah did. Isley misses the three-pointer. Yeah, but Utah had nine, ten days of rest between the conference final and the start of the final. Yeah, but Whereas you, the Bulls had to play a very tough series against Indiana, stretched to the limit, and had only two days before the final started. Yeah, but in the playoffs, you want to rest early so you can have your rhythm late coming into the championship round. Rodney gets it from Burrell and can't finish it. Second try, there it is. I tell you, I know Jerry Sloan well. I watched him play when he was in high school. And all he's going to tell his team is just keep competing. Keep competing. Carr misses. Keith had it knocked away by Jordan. And it will belong to Utah. Well, it's still only one game. You got two more left here in Chicago. It don't matter how many you lose by one or 50, you still lost. So you still got to come back and play, you know, game four and game five. The problem is you got to sit in Chicago now for three days and read and hear about this. And you can't do anything about it until Wednesday. And you know, Isaiah, how hard that is. Anderson from Isley hits the three. You ever have that happen in a final series? Both of you played in the NBA Finals where even though you thought you were one of the two best teams in the league, maybe the best, you got blown out like this and had to stew over it for a while? Yeah, we got blown out in, in Boston in a game one there in, in the garden. And, you know, you're reading about it, you're sitting around in your hotel room, the room service people are teasing you and everything else, but you bounce back the next game. That was in the conference finals, right? Yes. Michael to the hoop and foul. Tonight on NBC, after basketball, the star-studded American Film Institute salute to director Robert Wise immediately after the game, except on the West Coast. Zeke, I know that you often cue up a tape of the sound of music yourself, don't you? You see, that ain't even right. <laughs> the hills are alive with that sound of music for you, Zeke. My, my daughter loves the sound of music. However, when I grew up on the west side of Chicago, my boys wouldn't let me listen to the sound of music. Well, West Side Story, <laughs> which I think Robert Wise also directed, isn't about the west side of Chicago. But we're closer to home, I guess. Isley comes up and has to heave it to beat the shot clock. And that sequence, as much as anything, pretty much sums up the game for the Utah Jazz, who trail by 27 after three. 
This is a team that won 62 games and won both head-to-head -head against Chicago in the regular season. Down by 27. You're watching the NBA on NBC. This copyrighted telecast of the National Basketball Association may not be retransmitted, reproduced, or rebroadcast without the express written consent of the NBA. Chicago clicking in all phases of its game, but you've got to start with defense. Going back to the fourth quarter of their game two win at the Delta Center. When they held Utah to just 15 points, and in fact, in game one, although they lost in overtime in the fourth quarter, they held them to 12. Over the last four quarters, they've allowed only 60 points. A full game's worth of play, only 60 points allowed to the Utah Jazz. It's not just Stockton and Malone. I mean, this is a team with multiple weapons, and Chicago is shutting them down. Jordan begins the fourth quarter on the bench. Kerr is in. Pippen. Bounced it off his foot, and Keith picks it up. Isley to Shandon Anderson. Utah ball. Whistle on the inbound. Offensive foul on the Jazz. Antoine Carr set the moving screen, but it really wasn't his fault because Howard Isley went too quickly, Isaiah. He never gave him a chance to screen. Yeah, and, and coming off for a screen, you must wait for the screen to get set. Lambeer used to scream at me constantly because I would get him offensive foul because I was so anxious to move to get to the basketball. Kukoc on the move. Hold on. He stepped out of bounds, trying to drive the baseline. He stepped on the end line. If you're just tuning in, that's no typo. Chicago 72, Utah 45. Burrell held Anderson. See, Utah is a lot like Indiana, Bob, in that they do so much of their offense off the dribble. And Chicago really could lock into a team like that. Remember with Mark Jackson, you've seen it with a Stockton and Isley. Chicago does a lot of stuff with a passing on the move, and it's much tougher to defend those kind of teams. Utah came into this series brimming with confidence. Not bravado, but confidence. Anderson with the offensive foul. They had played Chicago tough in the final a year ago. They came back with essentially the same team. Only the 12th man, Jock Vaughn for Stephen Howard, was different. They had won both regular season games against Chicago head-to-head. -head. They had swept a formidable Laker team in the conference final while the Bulls were stretched to seven by Indiana. They had the home court advantage. They believed that they had every chance to beat the Bulls, and they still might. But this one has got to take a little wind out of their sails. It's not just a defeat. They're being embarrassed here. And Chicago has got to feel, especially with a couple of days rest at home, that all the momentum belongs to them. Well, Bob, when you lose a heartbreaking game like they lost in game two, and you talk to your team and get them ready, that's one thing. When you get embarrassed, you don't have to say much. These guys all have great pride. Isley steals it from Rodman. Adam Keith now with the slam. See, what happens in the series as it progresses, these two teams know each other so well. You know all their sets, you know all their plays, you know all their tendencies. So the game really breaks down to individual skills and individual talent. And Chicago have more playmakers that can make plays than Utah does at this point in time. Here's Burrell. He gets the roll. Scott Burrell with half a dozen. As Doug noted earlier, Isaiah, if you're going to lose, especially like this, and especially when you're on the road and just sitting around a hotel room, that's when you'd like to play almost right away. Not wait till Wednesday night. It, it doesn't matter. You know, at some point in time, you're going to lose games. You just got to have enough composure, discipline, and concentration to stay true to your character. Pippen, Burrell. How about that? Rodman threw the long touchdown pass. Pippen caught it backpedaling. And Burrell finished it with a nifty left-hand lay-in. See, that's what I mean. They, they have playmakers. That, that, you can't teach that as a coach. That's all just individual talent, people making plays. Morris, way off. 
off with a three. Didn't draw iron. Ball was kicked, and Utah will have it. That last play is indicative of exactly what Chicago's been all day long. They played a perfect basketball game, really on both ends of the floor. Watch Burrell fake the pass to Scotty. Both defenders go to him, and he gets the roll with a nice little finger roll. And then the great fast break from Scotty Pippen. Rodman with a long home run pass. Scotty off balance, tips it back with two hands, and what's the finish by Burrell off the left, off the glass with the left hand. That isn't just good, it's gorgeous. Talking about the play, not Dennis. The NBA on NBC is brought to you by Gap, by Cadillac and your Cadillac dealer, and by Mountain Dew, who reminds you to do the do. Our thanks to Captain Larry Chambers from Lighthouse Point, Florida, and the entire crew of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes for tonight's overhead shots. If you want to learn more about the blimps, try their internet site at www.goodyear.com. Dennis Rodman, the big man, as we used to call him in Detroit defensively. He's doing a great job on Carmelo. Carmelo got off, started hot, but Rodman has come in to shut him down. And look at the long over the head touch pass from Rodman to Pippen to Burrell. Beautiful. Dennis Rodman has been one of the keys to Chicago's defense all season long. And in this series, he's done an excellent job in shutting down Malone. Malone and Stockton both on the bench right now with this game out of hand. Morris spinning and hitting off the glass. Chicago by 27. Burrell cutting through and Longley finding him. They're just picking them apart right now. Utah didn't even talk on that interchange. Kerr came off. Both players came with him, and Burrell slipped it once again. The thing that I admire about these two teams, Chicago and Utah, is that they're true to their offense. They're true to their character. There's no such thing as garbage time for them. But there's such a thing as a terrible game, and Utah's having it. Here's Bushler in for the first time. Pippen, Longley, stampeding through, and Carr knocks it away. You know, a lot of teams, Doug, at this point in time in the game, you see players try to do things that they're not capable of doing. Maybe that was one of them. <laughs> he missed it badly, Morris did. Kerr, wide open look at a three, and finally he gets off. Now that was in character. <laughs> That's the shot he should take. The shot he's paid to take and usually makes. Morris shoved back in his face by Bushler. Here comes Kerr. To Pippen, who was fouled by Shandon Anderson. If my math is correct, this is now a 32-point lead. He talked about icing his knees for the entire fourth quarter. That's what he can do if he's content with just 24 points. And 24 points and only 14 shots today. That tells you how efficient his offense was. And Longley picks up his fourth, though it scarcely matters now. You know, this may be a good time to give Scottie Pippen some rest and get Randy Brown into the game. I don't know what happened to him, but he's been buried on that Chicago bench since this series started. Well, it's interesting with Scotty being in there because the last thing you want him to do is tweak an ankle or bang a knee or something, which would hurt him for Wednesday. But I think they're playing so efficiently right now that Scotty's the leader of that, and Phil still has him out there. This is Foster with the ball. Now Jacques Vaughn, the rookie from Kansas, in for the first time in the entire series. Anderson. Keith sends it back outside to Morris. Rainbow is almost banked in for three. shot the first time he said I got to get my buddy Judd Bushler from Arizona a shot he gave it back to him got a little piece of tape on the floor back to back threes now for Kerr Foster left alone can't hit him but the tip is there for Adam Keith 
And Bob, remember, this team scored a, over 100 points twice in the regular season versus Chicago. Shot over 50% in both games. They're sitting on 51 points right now. With six minutes to play in the game. Longley against Foster, left hand. Hits the front of the rim and Vaughn comes back the other way. Off Keith's hands, Bushler picks it up. The record low for points in a finals game since the advent of the 24 second clock is 71. The old Syracuse Nats in 1955 and Houston against the Celtics in 81. Heading into commercial, there's still plenty for Chicago fans to cheer about. One of their favorites, Steve Kerr, having his moments. Well, you do what you do best. You shoot the three. Steve Kerr spaces the floor. Scotty Pippen finds him. And now Bushler couldn't get his shot off. Steve, you're open. You're hot. Let it go. Back-to-back -back threes for Steve Kerr. Back-to-back -back threes and a lead of 33. Following the game on most of these NBC stations, it's your local news. And for those of you who want more basketball, switch over to the cable side for the CNBC post-game report. The entire pre-game cast will be here, plus Isaiah, Doug, and myself to review this game and look ahead to Wednesday's Game 4. And now let's go to Jim Gray. All right, Bob, thank you. Let me take you guys about a month ago, back on May the 9th. Game three was played in San Antonio in the second round. The San Antonio Spurs beat the Utah Jazz by 22 points. In that game, the Jazz only scored 64 points. That was a playoff low. Well, they came back the very next day and won game four in San Antonio, so there is some precedent for them being blown out in the playoffs and coming back. Bob? Thanks, Jim. Wennington in the lineup. Misses the jumper. Vaughn brings it back, and Doug, if you were in Jerry Sloan's shoes, how would you approach this the next couple of days before game four? Well, Bob, you're probably going to laugh at this, but I would probably say, you know what, guys, I don't want to see you tomorrow. I want you to get along with your thoughts and think about what you have to do. The coaches and I are going to watch tape. We're going to come back. We're going to have a great practice on Saturday. We're going to regroup them, excuse me, on Tuesday, and we're going to play. And, and maybe sometimes the less you say, the better, because this team won 62 games. They didn't do that by accident. They have great pride. The crowd erupts, and so does Michael, as Judd Bushler cans a three. The lead is 36. Morris back rims his jumper. So, Bob, what I'm saying is I rely on this team's pride. I rely on Stockton, Hornacek. Malone to say, you know what, guys, we got to come back in and get game four. We cannot be facing an elimination game here in game five. Morris was fouled as he moved through the lane. Stockton's evening is finished. At age 36, he missed the first 18 games this year, speaking of Stockton, with a knee injury. He had a 10-year stretch in the prime of his career where he missed only four games. Led the league in assists nine of those 10 years. Consistently scored 15 16 a game. One of the greatest players in NBA history, as is Malone. But neither has experienced an NBA championship. Well, I, I guarantee you that guy Stockton and Malone, as soon as this game is over, they probably want to get back in the gym and start practicing. Because when you're in the finals and you're playing in championship level play like they are, you don't want any days off. You can rest in the summer. I don't think it's about rest, Isaiah. I think it's about mentally getting yourself to do what you have to do because practice tomorrow is not going to do that. Bushler almost had his second in a row, but it's spun out. There's going to have to be things they're going to have to do X and O wise, though, because Chicago has completely taken them out of their screen roll. They've kept them pushed to the sideline. They've got Stockton down on the baseline. They've rotated and they've allowed Pippen to totally disrupt everything by playing a guy who doesn't score. But I tell you the message that that sends to Chicago. I remember we were playing Atlanta Hawks in the playoffs and they took a day off. That immediately told us that, hey, these guys aren't serious. They don't want to be here. They're out golfing or playing or doing whatever they want to do. We came back and that gave us enough incentive to destroy them. 
Jordan, Harper, Pippen, Kukos, all enjoying it from a ringside seat. Of course, if this were a boxing match, they would have stopped it already on cuts. Vaughn. It is a virtual certainty that Utah will set a new low for points in a finals game. Bushler bats it to Simpkins. He gets the dunk, and now only Randy Brown and Bill Wennington have to be accounted for. Isaiah, I don't know if I've ever seen a game where a team has played so aggressively and every ball has sort of bounced their way. I mean, every every play, every tip ball, it seems like Chicago shooting a layup or a dunk. Right, but you, you know how that is, Doug. In the next game, all that good luck turns around and goes the other way. So Utah just have to hang in there and keep plugging away. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on this series. Vaughn again, and he comes up empty once more. Ostertag can't find the handle. Two and a half minutes until this nightmare ends for Utah. Bushler wants another three. He's got it. I don't think Phil Jackson can believe this. I, I looked over and the, and the look on his face was, I wish we could save some of these. It's not going to be this easy on Wednesday night. No, not at all. Foster's shot rattles in and out. Chicago by 40 as we move inside two minutes. Randy Brown and Foster takes it. You know, during this regular season, we did a game at Market Square Arena. Vaughn into the lane, dumping it off for Anderson. And he can't convert it, in which the Pacers, playing without Rick Smith and Reggie Miller, scored 55 points. That's the record low for any game, regular season or playoffs, since the advent of the 24-second clock. Right now, there's a minute and a half to play, and Utah has just 52. Vaughn to the basket, no again. Well, Utah's going to break the record, dubious as it is, for fewest points, Randy Brown. He gets his bucket, and now it's only Wennington who hasn't scored among all the players in uniform for Chicago. Utah's going to break the record for fewest points in a finals game, fewest points in a playoff game of any kind, and unless they score three points somewhere along the line, Vaughn still can't hit. Ostertag can. So unless they score another basket, they're going to break the record somehow. The Utah Jazz are going to break the record for the fewest points ever scored in an NBA game in which the shot clock was a factor. Someone got a piece of brown shot. Simpkins was fouled. Now you watch the fast break out of the Chicago Bulls. They're having a good time. Everybody's enjoying it. You see the left-handed push pass to Burrell. The touch pass by Randy Brown. Deflected in the air. Judd Bushler, the former volleyball player, to Dickie Simpkins. And Michael says, oh my, Dickie. <laughs> And you're watching the NBA on NBC. Go get it, Zeke. <laughs> <laughs>Simpkins missed them both. The ball out of bounds, and let's see who touched it last. Brown did not get in the way of it. He let it go out, and it's a Utah turnover. 
one shot differential, so they're going to have to shoot it. But I guarantee you, Phil Jackson really doesn't care where they shoot. He doesn't want him to score here. If he, if he could, he'd like for just to hold it and let this game get over with. Wennington, the only bull who hasn't scored, so let him do it. Well, the evening is complete. Every I has been dotted, every T has been crossed. Vaughn at the buzzer. A total humiliation for the Utah Jazz. Beaten by 42 and held to the lowest scoring output in the history of the NBA. Chicago leads the series two games to one, but somehow it seems like more than that. Ahmad Rashad surprisingly has secured Michael Jordan for an interview. Go Ahmad. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Michael, one thing that you guaranteed before this whole series started was that you were going to have fun. And tonight it looked like you did have a lot of fun. Yeah, I think everybody had a good time. I think we came out, we played hard. You know, the game kind of got lopsided, which is kind of unexpected. We didn't really expect to win this easily, but we put a lot of good effort out there on the basketball court. And you know, it, the result was that we could relax a little bit in the fourth quarter. And, you, know, you can see a lot of guys really enjoying themselves. How is it that you turned up the defensive end so strong tonight? We got a good feel in terms of what they're running. You know, in our defense, once we have a good feel, then we can aggressively start to attack them a little bit. And you know, early on in the first quarter, we, we were probably just reserving some of their, uh, their adjustments. And then once we got a feel for their adjustments, then we begin to become aggressive. All right, congratulations to you. All right, let's go back to Bob. Thanks, Ahmad, and Jim Gray is going to talk with Carl Malone when we come back to the United Center after these messages. Win or lose, Carl Malone always is available, and moments ago he spoke with our Jim Gray. All right, thank you very much, Bob. Carl, this is the lowest output in the history of an NBA game. What happened to the Jazz tonight? We just didn't come ready to play. You give them a lot of credit. You know, we just got old-fashioned butt kicking, so if this don't wake us up, nothing will. You were waking up like this one time before in San Antonio. You lost by 22 in game three, came back and won. How mentally difficult will it be for you guys to be here in Chicago for three days and not be able to play the game? It shouldn't be. We should be have our ass ready to play. Thank you, Carl. All right, Bob, back to you. Carl Malone mincing no words. Luckily, it's late. Most of the kids are in bed. We'll put this one to bed when we come back to the United Center after this. Just take a look at that. It tells an absolutely stunning story as the Bulls take a 2-1 lead in the series. So that brings us to the schedule for games four and five, both in Chicago, each on the air, Wednesday and Friday at 9 o'clock Eastern time. If Utah can win one or both of those games, then the series will come back to the Delta Center for games six and seven. Now, coming up next, except for those of you on the West Coast, it's the star-studded American Film Institute salute to director Robert Wise. And for those of you who'd like to continue with the NBA Finals, interviews and post-game activities are available on CNBC immediately following these messages. For Isaiah Thomas, Doug Collins, Jim Gray, and Ahmad Rashad, I'm Bob Costas. This has been the NBA on NBC.